Hello Star Wars fans and welcome to episode 78 of Journey into Legends. Today we begin the New Jedi Order series with Vector Prime by R.A. Salvatore. Released in 1999, Vector Prime is the first book in the massive New Jedi Order series and introduces the Yuuzhan Vong. I am beyond excited to begin this series. Everything I've been reading for around two years has led to this series and I just can't wait to jump in. Without further ado, let's read and review. One thing that surprised me about this book was how small scale and almost slow paced it was for most of the book. There's certainly an underlying sense of dread building throughout the book, but still, for more than half of the book, our heroes are dealing with local threats, smugglers, politicians. They even take the time to race in Lando's Folly, an asteroid belt owned by Lando. And at first, I was a bit disappointed and getting a little impatient waiting for the action to kick in, but I think that in the long run, this was definitely the right way to go. Once the Yuuzhan Vong finally arrive in full force, it was a lot more impactful and sudden after the relative small scale of the first half of the book. And because of this, the book does a really good job of feeling like a true transition from the Bantam era into the Del Rey era. When we meet our heroes at the start of this book, there are already multiple personal struggles and battles being fought. We have Luke trying to reinstate the Jedi Council and meeting opposition in the form of certain members of the New Republic Council, including the new Chief of State, Borsk Falia. We also have some philosophical differences regarding the Force and the Jedi between Jason and Anakin, differences that I'm sure will continue to permeate throughout future books. But perhaps the most serious of all is Mara Jade, who we find out has been struggling with a mysterious and dilapidating molecular disease eating away at her strength. It was an interesting decision not to feature her initial infection at the hands of Nomenor. I definitely don't think it was a necessary inclusion, and the book certainly doesn't suffer without it, but I was interested nonetheless in how exactly that happened. Although our heroes enjoy a period of relative peace, the first half of the book does feature the sinister machinations of the Praetorate Vong, working behind the scenes to distract and weaken the New Republic from within. One of these schemes is orchestrated by the mysterious Gnome Anor, a cult leader fomenting tensions between the planets of Ramamul and Osarian as a way to turn the New Republic's attention inward. While that's going on in the core, all the way out on the edge of the galaxy, another Vong agent named Yeoman Carr has infiltrated a research station on Belkadan called Exgal 4. And this little subplot might be my absolute favorite from the whole book. I found Yeoman Carr's manipulation and subsequent extermination of these scientists brutal, sad, and epic all at the same time. I loved how absolutely despicable Yeoman Carr was as a villain. There was no undercurrent of sympathy or nobility, he's just simply a dick. Probably the weakest Praetor at Vong subplot in this book was Degara and his world ship establishing a base on Helska 4. Degara was easily the weakest of the main Yuuzhan Vong characters, and although I really enjoyed the bleakness and hopelessness of Danny Kui and Miko Reglius' imprisonment, I found all the Helska 4 chapters to be less interesting than the rest, and the Battle of Helska 4 at the end of the book was easily the weakest of the book. Like I mentioned earlier, I think the slowness of the first half added a lot of impact to the Yuuzhan Vong's eventual arrival. 
The second half of this book was very fast-paced, with the Yuuzhan Vong quickly striking at multiple targets, giving us quite a few really entertaining battles, such as the systematic destruction of Kip Duron's squadron at Helska IV, the destruction of Cernpedal, and the Battle of Dubrillion. However, I found the final battle of Helska IV to be really underwhelming, specifically because I thought the strategy used to defeat the Vong and destroy the planet made absolutely no sense whatsoever. Basically, the New Republic used shield ships to reflect the Yamask's energy back onto the planet, which would decrease the temperature and freeze the planet and the Vong, which results in the planet exploding somehow. I thought this was such a dumb strategy that made no sense. How would reflecting energy back onto the planet decrease the temperature, and how would the freezing cause the planet to explode? It wasn't enough to affect my thoughts on the book as a whole, but I found this whole battle really dumb. And I've yet to talk about the moment that this book is most known for and is notorious for, which is, of course, the death of Chewbacca. And I really enjoyed how this death was handled. It was sad, it was epic, and it was totally fitting for his character. He died honoring his life debt to Han and his family, and he died standing tall, defiant, and stoic. And I think that this was the best possible death for the character. I think it's really dumb how controversial this death was and how it caused so many people to stop reading. I understand not wanting a beloved character to get killed off, but when the death is as fitting and as well written as this one was, I think it genuinely enhances the character. I also think that it was a necessary, groundbreaking step in setting the stage for this darker series. I mean, Han even says at the very end of this book that nobody is safe anymore. I thought this was a fantastic way of raising the stakes and letting readers know that there is no plot armor anymore. So overall, I actually didn't enjoy this book quite as much as I expected. The book was much slower, and the book didn't treat the Yuuzhan Vong as much of a major threat as I was expecting. It almost didn't feel like the beginning of a 19-book series. I also found R.A. Salvatore's writing weak at times. Some of his character writing just didn't quite work for me, and again, I feel like he underplayed the threat posed by the Yuuzhan Vong. However, despite that, I still really enjoyed the book. I thought it did a great job of introducing the Yuuzhan Vong, their culture, and their weapons and technology, and I'm really excited to continue the series. All right, now we have Star Wars Tales issue number three, which has four stories, starting with The Death of Captain Tarpoles, which is a short little comic about Jar Jar and actually features his banishment from Otogunga. Overall, this wasn't the greatest story, and trying to understand Gungan's speech made it pretty irritating to read. Next, we have Deal with a Demon, which actually sees the return of Vili from the Star Wars Dark Horse comics, as he's hired to rescue a young princess from a purist regime on the planet Utula. As the story goes on, Vili betrays his mistral companion, which turns out to be a feint, and he successfully rescues the princess. This was a pretty fun story, I liked seeing Vili again, and like always, he was a joy to read about. And then we have Lady Luck, which sees Lando participate in a Sabacc game against the Baron of Cloud City, with ownership of the city on the line. With help from the Baron's mistress and the people of Cloud City, Lando wins and becomes Baron Administrator. Overall, we've seen plenty of stories about Sabacc, and this was just yet another one, nothing too special. It was neat, however, to see Lando become Baron. It was also great to see Barpotamus Drebbel from the original Marvel comics. Our last story is called Three Against the Galaxy, which follows a Gamorrean named Grissom, a Jawa named Tek, and a young girl named Arista. After a bar fight, Grissom is thrown into the mines run by Arista's father. When Arista's uncle Seth attempts to assassinate Arista and her father and take over the mines, Grissom rescues Arista. On the run from Uncle Seth, they meet a Jawa named Tek, who has a bounty out for him, and Grissom turns in the Jawa, collects the reward, then rescues the Jawa, and the three escape together. Overall, this story was nothing too special, but I did enjoy it. The team of a girl, a Gamorrean, and a Jawa is pretty funny, and as a whole, the story was pretty inoffensive. Overall, this was a decent issue. It didn't have any great standout stories, but it also didn't have any bad non-canon ones, so that's good, I guess. 
Anyways, thank you all for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And stay tuned for my next review, where I'll be continuing the New Jedi Order series with the first book in the Dark Tide duology, Onslaught. See ya.